1 Kings chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. This is God's word eternally true. It took Solomon 13 years, however, to complete the construction of his palace. He built the palace of the forest of Lebanon, 100 cubits long, 50 wide, and 30 high with four rows of cedar columns supporting trimmed cedar beams. It was roofed with cedar above the beams that rested on the columns, 45 beams, 15 to a row. Its windows were placed high in sets of three facing each other. All the doorways had rectangular frames. They were in the front part in sets of three facing each other. He made a colonnade 50 cubits long and 30 wide. In front of it was a portico, and in front of that were pillars and an overhanging roof. He built the throne hall, the hall of justice, where he was to judge, and he covered it with cedar from floor to ceiling. And the palace in which he was to live, set farther back, was similar in design. Solomon also made a palace like this hall for Pharaoh's daughter, whom he had married. All these structures, from the outside to the great courtyard, and from the foundation to the eaves, were made of blocks of high-grade stone cut to size and trimmed with a saw, on their inner and outer faces. The foundations were laid with large stones of good quality, some measuring ten cubits and some eight. Above were high-grade stones cut to size and cedar beams. The great courtyard was surrounded by a wall of three courses of dressed stone and one course of trimmed cedar beams, as was the inner courtyard of the temple of the Lord with its portico. Here ends our reading. There is a response of thankfulness printed for us in our bulletins. The word of the Lord. Thanks indeed. Let's pray. Um, one of the reasons that uh, Mallory is headed to Ohio State is I have two parents who went there. They got engaged on the 50-yard line at Ohio Stadium uh, back in, I suppose, 1961 um, or 1960, somewhere around, somewhere around there. Uh, my dad taught there. My wife, Betsy, went there. Um, so that's fun. But one of the other fun facts about Columbus, uh, Columbus is that uh, Mike Tyson, who I think the greatest boxer ever, despite what, who he is and all that kind of thing, but if you watch him, man, uh, he, people were scared of him. In championship fights, literally scared because he was so powerful and just knocked people out in the first round. First person to ever beat him was from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, this happened in 1990. There's a guy named Buster Douglas. And uh, Buster Douglas uh, uh, fought this, this fight and, and beat Mike Tyson. And it was like nobody expected it to happen. It was just another fight uh, for Mike Tyson. But then, uh, you know, Buster Douglas earned this great paycheck for fighting this. The fight was in uh, Tokyo, I think, or in Japan. Um, but then there was a rematch scheduled. Uh, but you know what Buster did? He went home and ate <laughs> and enjoyed the new money he had found and spent money and, and relaxed and that kind of thing. And so he came to this rematch out of shape and, and quickly was dispensed of uh, by Mike Tyson in the, the second match. Uh, as we saw in some of our readings that Jim read for us this morning, God had this great plan for his people. He rescued them out of their slavery in Egypt, ten plagues and all that, parting the Red Sea, and it was to bring them to this promised land, Israel. Um, and he brings them to the promised land, uh, and they cross the Jordan, and they defeat all their enemies there, and it's God's plan to place them in this promised land and to bless them abundantly. Now this was all by grace, where we find out, and one of the reasons for the Ten Commandments uh, containing these two commands at the beginning, no other gods, and don't uh, have idols, is because some of them were worshiping idols and had other gods when they were in Egypt. They were not contrary to uh, what we see in Charlton Heston's version uh, uh, of the Ten Commandments. All faithful people looking for God, uh, they're told by Moses to put away their idols. That means they had them. Now, even after they had come out of Egypt. Uh, but God's plan for his people was in the promised land. These old, this Old Testament people got to bless them abundantly. And so we read about that in, in Deuteronomy 28. What's God's plan? What's his intent for his people? Not to curse them. Not to make things difficult for them. 
but to bless them and to give them abundant flocks and great produce. This is what we're reading about in, in Deuteronomy 12 as they lived in the land. And that when nations would attack them, they'd come from one direction, but God's people would, would turn and face them in battle and their en enemies would scatter in seven directions, totally in confusion. That's God's design for His people, Old Testament Israel. That God would bless God's people's offspring in the land. That this would be a place of abundance. Uh, and, and so we see this being God's intent. And so the question is, when we get to First and Second Kings, and we're dealing with two books that were written to people who had, after the days of Moses, much, much later, um, they were almost uh, 800, uh, 900 years later, they, they found themselves in exile. They were no longer in this promised land, experiencing these blessings that God had declared He wanted to give them in Deuteronomy 28. They had experienced those things for a while, and off and on, but they find themselves out of exile. And we see just a, a hint of what can happen here in this passage in 1 Kings 7. Now in 1 Kings 7, God is still abundantly blessing His people in the promised land through Solomon. And because of Solomon, and because of Solomon's faithfulness. And so we talked last week about how Solomon first takes care of building the temple. That's chapter 6. He gets that done and in good order, seven years. And he gives his attention to it, and he gets this done. And then after that, he builds the palace. And in the palace, there's a, a place in the back for him. A place in the back for his wife, uh, who was... Uh, Pharaoh's daughter, who we assume from Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, was faithful to the God of Israel. Solomon says to his son, listen to your mother. And it seems, as, and, and we see this in uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 3 as well. She comes up from Egypt, she accepts the God of Israel like uh, uh, Ruth does. Ruth was a Moabite, but she comes and accepts the God of Israel. Or like Rahab, one of the Canaanites accepts the God of Israel. And so this is the time in chapter 7 that God is abundantly blessing His people. So last week we talked about that God blesses His people and blesses Solomon, the king He has selected for His people, with this extravagant palace. Now Jerusalem was along a trade route, and people would come into Jerusalem and tra trade. They'd, they'd sell their stuff and buy stuff. And as they would come to Jerusalem and walk by Jerusalem, they could look up and they could see these two structures magnificently high side by side in Jerusalem. The temple that Solomon had built and next to it on the north side, the palace. And this was a sign to all those foreigners who walked through the land of Israel that this is the land that somebody's blessing. And that this must be a place where there's a real God who rules and who provides for and blesses his people. That's one of the functions of the temple, one of the functions of the palace, that foreigners would come by and say, the God of all gods must live here. He must dwell here. He must bless these people. And so that was a sign to them as they passed by Jerusalem. So that's what God is doing in Solomon. And so we're at one of the heights, and we see the, the height of uh, God's blessing on his people through chapter 10 of 1 Kings. You see this uh, uh, highlighted or uh, at its peak in chapter 10 when the queen of Sheba coming down from the south, sometimes she's called the queen of the south, she comes up because she's heard of Solomon's wisdom and the splendor and the riches and the glory of his kingdom. And so she comes to see if this is all true and she concludes there, this is better than I was even told. And so that's what God's about, blessing his people. So the question we have, and is people who know how Solomon ended in his life, as people understand chapter 11 of 1 Kings, which we'll get to, where Solomon goes astray. As we think about how God's people wound up in exile in Babylon, like Daniel and Esther, 
How did they get there? And so the question we're looking at in this passage is one, how does one have the blessing of God? And two, how does he or she keep it? What, what, what's our role? Do we have a role in this? And, and, and we do. So we look first at, at how the, we devote ourselves, as we looked at last week. We devote ourselves first to the worship of God in our spiritual lives. That's what we talked about last week. This is what Solomon has devoted himself to. This is what we're to see. He devotes himself first to the worship of God, building the temple first, and to having all things spiritually set forward first, before we mess with other stuff, like a palace. Um, Then we look at, this morning, how we combat the potential downfall and ruin of our own lives, or for a church that belongs to a denomination, how we combat the downfall of our own denomination, or whatever it is. So the question is, your introduction there. If you'd like to fill up length in that line, here we go. We're starting with that now. Um, You can fill those in. If you want to just listen, that's fine too. We're looking at, how do I arrive? How do I arrive and stay in God's blessings in my life? Now this can be true for a denomination. It can be true for a local church. It can be true for a person. So number one. Uh, first, we looked at last week, putting worship and spiritual life first uh, has this result. We kind of talked about it last week, but we didn't come out and say it, and it's this. Number one, God will bless. God will bless, as he did for Jesus, the person who put worship and spiritual life first better than anyone, Jesus did. God will bless, as he did for Jesus, um, uh, us as we put our spiritual life and worship first. Oh, Jim read for us Matthew 6, 33. Um, Seek first, what? His kingdom and his righteousness, and then what? All these things will be added to you. This is after Jesus says, don't let money be your God. Okay, we got a break there in our Bibles, right? But there's no break there. Right? That's just an editorial comment. They put, a, they put a little thing there between chapter between verse 24 and 25. But Jesus, this is the discussion. Jesus says, you can't have two masters. You'll love one and hate the other. So you need to have one master. It needs to be God, not money. And then he says, don't worry about money. Because God clothes the field with lilies. God will take care of you. Don't worry about stuff. Don't build the palace first. Build the temple first. Have your life be a build the temple first life. God, my spiritual life first. My worship of God first before everything else. Money, employment, job, sports, whatever else you can do that can come before God and the worship of Him. And so we, we seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all the other stuff God's going to take care of. He feeds the birds of the air. They're not worried. The field's not worried. You shouldn't be worried either. Follow God, and as my dad used to say, let the chips fall where they will. Okay? Do what's right. Let the chips fall where they will. Follow, seek God. Let the chips fall where they will. Let God be, God's responsible for the consequences, for the follow-up, for the results. We're just responsible for our faithfulness to seek God first and to worship Him as a top priority in our lives. So we see this for Jesus in Revelation 5. He seeks, as we talked about last week, His sacrificing Himself on the cross was an act of worship. Okay? He is high priest and sacrifice, and He worships God by Himself. Offering as high priest an act of worship, a perfect sacrifice to God his Father. And that perfect sacrifice was his own body, his own sinless body, body that not, had not sinned. Okay, and so Jesus does worship first, the cross, but in Revelation 5, we see what's he get later? Blessing. In Revelation 5, we see heaven is saying, who's going to save us? Who can read our names from the book of life? 
this scroll, this book of life is sealed with seven seals and no one's worthy to open these seven seals. Who's in heaven right now? And then behold, Revelation 5, Jesus arrives. After his ascension, he arrives into heaven and they say, look, a lamb who has been slain, he is worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because he's purchased the people whose names are on that scroll. That scroll is the book of life. Jesus bought the book of life so he could open it up. Uh, Mallory just had a birthday on Friday, you know, and because it's her birthday, she's worthy to open those presents, right? A lot she did for that, to be born that day. Uh, But only she can open those presents. It's not my birthday. I can't open them and say, thanks, myself. For this gift I wanted to get. Uh, but, but, but Jesus is worthy to open the scrolls because he's bought with his blood. That's the rest of Revelation 5. He bought those names with his blood. He bought you and me with his blood. He takes care of worship first. Then he goes up to heaven and everybody admires him. And they sing to him in worship. And they say, worthy are you, worthy are you our Lord and our God. You've purchased men with your blood. Glory and honor and power to you. So we see in Jesus' own pattern, worship comes first, cross, and then blessing later. And so we make that note in our lives. If I want blessing in my life, God who is sovereign over every micro-event on the earth ever, He's the giver of blessing. And so how can I expect to have blessing unless I have blessing that comes from Him? So what do I seek to do? To walk in His ways. As Jesus did. Blessing doesn't come from where Satan tells us it comes from. That's temptation. Satan is telling you in temptation, he tells me in temptation, you will have greater blessing if you do this thing that's not according to God's Word. And he holds out for you a prize. And then you take it and you see it's just a vapor. And you say, I'm such a fool. Right? That's temptation. But we walk in God's ways and he blesses He blesses us. So we arrive there um, and we, we arrive in blessing uh, and we experience blessing just as Jesus does by putting worship first, spiritual life first. For us, this happens Additionally, in our future, when Jesus comes back. And that's Revelation 21 and 22. The book of Revelation, chapters 1 through 20, talk about you're going to get beat up because you're a believer in Jesus. That's your life. Okay, People are going to trample on you, chapter 11, and they're going to rejoice. This believer who makes my conscience feel bad because I'm in sin and he's worshiping God and I'm not, He's now downtrodden, and they rejoice. Okay, not each and every person who's not a believer. That's not. Right? 2 2 Timothy 3.12 All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's our lives here. That's our expectation here. Our expectation is not uh, Deuteronomy 28 promised land. You know, if you're a farmer, none of you are farmers, but if you're a farmer, big crops. You may have years where you have abundant crops if you're a farmer and a believer. You may have years where there's drought. It's just not, it's just not the promise for us now. We'll talk about what that, what that is in just a second here. Sorry for those of you who like to check boxes real fast. <laughs> um, but God will bless uh, certainly body and soul, Revelation 21 22, in the new heavens and new earth. Then all that stuff in, in, Revel- in, in uh, Deuteronomy 20 will come true. Except for the, the part about the enemies. They'll be scattered at final judgment. Running away in, in, in seven directions at final judgment. And we won't see them ever again. Okay, but all these uh, blessings of soul and body will be true for us when Jesus returns. Final judgment happens. And we dw- he dwells with us and we with him. Uh, uh, on the earth, uh, recreated for us. So, qualifications. What kind of blessings should we expect? What kind of blessings does Scripture 
expect us to expect. We could take a look at, at Deuteronomy 28. We could be prosperity gospel and say, now if you just believe, you know, God will give you, you know, an a ever-increasing paycheck and everything's going to zippity doo da go your way. Right? My oh my, what a wonderful day. But number one, qualifications, um, or A there, as with Jesus in his life on earth, so we get direction from what was Jesus' life on earth. When he lived on earth, what kind of blessings did he get? And was he only blessed? He winds up on a cross. Okay, so how do we qualify this? What should we expect in our lives? Well, like Jesus, as with Jesus on, in his life on earth, number one, in this era prior to Jesus' return, this blessing that we speak of is a guarantee regarding your soul. This is a guarantee regarding your soul. So as we saw Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8, um, that's in our um, declaration of, um, of the gospel. Which, where did my bulletin go? There it is. I'll read it for you. Boy, what a great passage, right? But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. He will be planted by the water, that, uh, by, like a tree planted by the water that sends its roots out to a stream. You know, if you're a tree and your roots go out to a stream, you get water all the time. Because they're by a stream. That's where water is. And so even though the ground might be dry below you, your roots are tapped in to a stream. And so Jeremiah goes on and says, it, the tree does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves will always be green. This is talking about our souls, the condition of our souls, even if we're in jail for our belief in Jesus. Our souls will be green, so to speak, living, prospering, Alive, not parched and dry. This tree has no worries in a year in a year of drought, and never fails to bear fruit. So this is the promise for us in our lives. This is not a promise of of, of a, a physical number two. It is not a guarantee of solely s o l e uh, of uh, solely good things for your life and your physical circumstances. Okay, the original audience knew this, right? The people in exile, they said, okay. <laughs> you know, even for us, that's not a guarantee of physical stuff. But, but this is a, a, a communication to us that the promise of blessing is to our souls for now. When Jesus comes back and we're in the new heavens and new earth, it'll be body and soul blessings, but for now it's blessing of soul. And we'll have occasional blessings to our bodies. We live in America, so the poorest of us is abundantly blessed in terms of world standards and historical standards, right? We're abundantly blessed physically, you know, despite what, you know, someone might tell you or if you compare yourself to someone who, you know, like the Rockefellers or someone like that, you might say, oh, I'm so cursed, you know, but... Don't, don't move to 50% of countries in the world who are in poverty, you know, who would qualify for welfare here, the whole country. Um, so, so we have certain physical blessings, but, but primarily what we're interacting with here is soul blessings. We're trees, we're people who trust in the Lord. And our roots, the roots of our souls, have extended to the stream of, next week we'll hear about living water the stream of water that nourishes us. Whether things are going well, or whether things are going, they're, they're difficult for us. And things are not going well. And, and we're, we're depressed because of our circumstances. Because too many things are not going well. Okay? So it's not a guarantee of solely good things for your life. It's not a guarantee of your physical circumstances. So Solomon, at the end of his life, when he reflects back on everything, he's about to die and he writes Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 8.14, one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. He says, all is meaningless. Here's why. The righteous man gets the wicked man's reward. And the wicked man gets the righteous man's reward. 
All is vanity. That's Solomon's conclusion. He's looked out on the world. He says so at the end of the book. He said, I've considered all things. And here's the conclusion. You, can't t- you, you don't know if being righteous and walking with the Lord is going to earn you death like it did for Jesus. Or if it's going to earn you abundance like it did for Abraham. You don't know. Because in this life, sometimes the wicked men prosper and the righteous men die. Or sometimes it's the other way around. So no guarantees uh, on those, those things. All those verses there are verses that talk about how we, like Jesus in this life, typically the norm is we suffer. Is we suffer. Um, now number three. Number three. Uh, as with Jesus in his life on earth, in your relationships, in your relationships, putting your spiritual life in worship first will often, often bless your relationships, but sometimes harm them. So because you believe in Jesus, because you walk with him, sometimes it'll bless your relationships, but sometimes it'll harm them. So we're told in Romans 12, bless and do not curse. Do not take vengeance. Pray for those who persecute you. Because vengeance is mine, says the Lord. It's not yours. So bless and do not curse. And sometimes, hopefully a lot of the time, because we're treating non-believers and believers that way, blessing them, being kind to them, being patient to them, even though they haven't treated us so well, that will win them over. And so then we are treated well. Then we're promoted. Because we've worked hard, even though we expressed to our boss, I think we'd be better that we do it this way. But he says, no, we're going to do it my way. And you, first page of our bulletin, cheerfully do your boss's will. Because you understand Romans 13, God puts all authorities in place in his sovereignty And it is a good and godly thing to follow your authority as long as he's asking you not to sin. But as you live out your faith, a lot of times that'll earn you blessing. But sometimes it'll earn you curse. Um, Paul talks about how sometimes because we're walking with Jesus, we carry around the hope of eternal life in us and we, we, we go to worship on Sundays and we and we walk in his ways, and we refuse to do certain sin that is commonly done, and that reminds people who aren't believers that judgment is coming. Paul calls us the aroma of life for those who have eternal life, but we're the aroma of death for those who are perishing. That is, we're a reminder that they owe their all to God, and that they will be judged for not giving their all to God. And so when they see us, they say, oh, you know, it's like Homer with Ned Flanders. Right? <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, that guy. <laughs> and, and so, but hear this. Jesus puts it this way. If the world hates you, keep in mind, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you. It would love you as its own, as it is You do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. So Jesus says, here's your your baseline. Expect the world to hate you because you're following me. And if they don't, consider it a blessing or a bonus. It's like, hey, wow, this is great. They're being nice to me. Um, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. No one has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel who will fail to receive a hundred times as much in the present age and in the age to come eternal life. Uh, Jesus said in, in Matthew, so we leave a lot of things to follow Jesus. That's not fun. And, and in Matthew 10, 32 through 37, he says, do not pretend, do not expect that I've come to bring peace on earth. Jesus, what do you mean? I didn't come to bring peace on earth, but a sword. And he goes on and explains, now get this, 
Jesus is talking to Jews. This is who Jesus was among. God's covenant people during his incarnation. And he's telling them, don't expect peace if you follow me. Because look, what's going to happen to me because I follow the one true God? I'm going to wind up on a cross. And you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to be divided from your mom and your dad and your brothers and your sisters. And they may turn on you and deliver you over to the authorities because they see you have abandoned the God of Israel. They, they, they'll stick with the Pharisees and the Pharisees' view of things. And therefore, Jesus says, I come to bring a sword. And the sword is dividing people between those who follow the one true son of David, the chosen son of David, me, and those who don't. And some of you have experienced that. Some of you have believed or you've left, you know, people leave the Jewish faith or maybe the Catholic faith or they've left uh, Islam or they've left Hinduism or they've left atheism and had their own parents say to them, I'm ashamed of you. Or in, in many countries, in, in is, uh, countries where Islam is present, uh, you know, believing in Jesus, converting to Christianity is a capital offense. And they see their parents say, I never want to talk to you again. You are not my son any longer. This is the, son, this is the sword Jesus talks about. And so just know that in your life. Walking with Christ and, and following, loving people as you love yourself, there will be some people who are reasonable and say, I like this guy. But there will be some who will hate you because you're a reminder of judgment to come. You're a follower of Jesus. Okay. Now B, B. So those are the qualifications there. And so Jesus experienced all those things. Um, even his own half-brothers didn't believe until after the resurrection. Uh, but B, in your life, know this, its quality will be full and rich. That's the good news. You may suffer, you may be persecuted in external, physical, circumstantial kind of ways, but your soul will be full and rich. And that's real life there. We all know rich people who feel very empty. We all know successful people who feel very empty and whose lives are a mess. But as we walk with the Lord, as we put worship first, as we put our spiritual lives in order first, our lives are, are full and rich, even with the difficulties that we experience. Because we have the warmness of that comfort we receive from the Lord, knowing that his blessing is upon us. Um, when I was in high school, I, I became, by 12th grade, I became a better player than I ever thought I would be. This doesn't mean I was great. I, wasn't, I started one game my senior year in high school. Uh, but here's the blessing of it. I worked hard at different things, and so I could dribble well. And I always tell people, hey, you know, life isn't fair. I'm a better dribbler. I'm a better shooter. Definitely a better foul shooter than Shaquille O'Neal. But he has millions of dollars, and I don't. But I'm the better basketball player. But I don't have. God in his sovereignty didn't give me a seven foot. I love Shaq. Isn't he great? He's like, everything he's in, it's like put him in every commercial to buy the thing, right? <laughs> um, but, but, you know, God gave Shaq the seven foot body that's this wide. You know, if, it, if you've been around the, from the 70s, you know, he's Wes Unseld with Kareem's height. Right? Wow. I remember when I first saw him, I thought, whoa, this is both. He's got the full package. He's not a skinny, tall guy. He's a really tall guy who's got that wide body that can get rebounds at will. Um, but I became a better basketball player than I thought I would be. But I didn't play much. And so that was a hardship for me. You know, going out there, and I'd done well in some other things, and there I went and sat on the bench. And some, day, some games I didn't get in at all. Um, and my dad became worried about me about halfway through the season, or maybe two-thirds of the way through, and he's trying to encourage me. And I said, Dad, I'm okay. I said, and I put it this way, don't, don't take it the wrong way. I said, I'm John Musgrave, whether I play or not. And what I meant was this. I was having fun in practice because I was shooting the ball and making it 
We did, we had, the three-point line came the year after I graduated from high school. But I could, I could bomb them. And I was bombing them over the first team in practice. And when the coach needed somebody to get out there at the end of the game and run the four corners offense, I was the guy because I, I could dribble well and handle the ball well. And I just knew that. And whether I was utilized or whether I, I, I lived the, the embarrassment of not being able to start on my high school basketball team, I had this... I had this knowledge inside. I was actually better than I thought I would ever be. I'd wound up to that place in, in, in 12th grade. And that's the kind of experience that we can have as, as believers. You know, everything can be crumbling around us, and the world can look at us and say, wow, look at your life. Things didn't really turn out for you, did they? But we know in our souls, I'm a child of God. The God of heaven who controls all things, he loves me. And did you, did you notice there, verse 6 of Psalm 1, he watches over the way of the righteous. That's us. God's blowing the wicked away like chaff. You know, that's dust. That's dust from the wheat, chaff. He's just blowing that all over the place. But he's watching over us. And he's protecting us. And that, that makes us feel good inside. It gives us comfort and strength inside. And we can have joy regardless of our circumstances. Uh, because because of that. Okay, so in your life, you've got this quality. Now, here's the thing to note from this passage. While this passage in and of itself, with these first 12 verses of chapter 7, are speaking of the glory and the blessing that God has given to his people and to Solomon and to his people through Solomon, we also have a foreshadowing of what can potentially go wrong when God blesses you. Because Solomon has everything going his way, and then we find out, come chapter 11, that that wasn't good for his soul, or he didn't handle that well. He could have, but he didn't. And that caused, ultimately, the exile of all God's people into various parts of the world and, and into Babylon. So here's number two. This is a huge principle in Scripture to get Number two, when God blesses you, be careful of your own heart. When God blesses you, be careful of your own heart. When God enables you even to experience you know, uh, physical circumstances that are good, like Allison Felix, she's a believer. Okay, became, she was a believer early in her life, and now she's the most uh, medal-winning uh, runner in history uh, for the United States. Won her 11th last night. She tied Carl Lewis with her 10th in the 400, getting the bronze, and then won the 11th with the, um, uh, the 4x400 uh, relay. Uh, got, got a gold medal with that. And, uh, and she you know, has this great blessing, and it's like, you know, God, you didn't have to do this, but you did. Um, you made me fast. And you enabled me to be fast enough that I could be a 17-year-old in the Olympics, starting to get medals. And a 35-year-old with a little girl, yeah, she's a mom now, still able to get a bronze medal, third fastest in the world in the 400, and gold medal level uh, in, the, in the relay. And, and so when that kind of thing happens, when God blesses us, we want to watch our hearts. We're going to watch our hearts. Um, so uh, uh, as we look here in Psalm 51, we remember God says, the sacrifices I want are broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. That's what I care about. And so why does God care about David so much? David sends a man to his death because he's committed adultery with that man's wife. And so he, he, he pushes. He's, he's not an accessory to murder or whatever. He's the causer of somebody, a murderer in effect, whatever you call that. Uh, and then he's an adulterer. Why, does God, why is God still so high on David after this even? It's because David is a good repenter. David's heart is always going back to the Lord even after he sinned. And David pens these words in Psalm 51. The sacrifices that God desires is a humble and contrite heart. And so we're always to remember our hearts are important. See, David, when he committed adultery but with Bathsheba, he hadn't gone out with the troops as he ordinarily had. Perhaps the wealth 
perhaps his position as king, start acting like other kings who sent out the peasant with their peasant fingers and peasant arms to fight for him. Instead of going forward in front of them, leading the troops as he had with Goliath and other instances, 2 Samuel 8 is all about David leading the troops in, in battle. And so David didn't handle blessing well, but we want to. So A, there in your outline, remember that God blesses those whose hearts, whose hearts look to him and seek him. This is what Psalm 1, 1 through 3 is about. Um, Psalm 1, 6 is about. Psalm 51, 17 that I just read to you. Uh, 2 Chronicles 16, 9. This is the prophet Hanani, uh, Hanani uh, to Asa, the king. For the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth, that the Lord might strongly support those whose heart is completely his. And so we always want to be careful where our hearts are. That's the important thing, that our hearts are completely the Lord's, whether we're in difficult circumstances or in great blessing. Hebrews eleven sixteen, a little more familiar to us. He is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. He's a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. So B, if your heart strays from looking to God, if your heart strays from looking to God as Solomon's heart later would, having been blessed so greatly. Um, and as his heart strays, we see that in chapter 11. God will bring discipline to you. Discipline to you, not blessing, out of his love for you. Hebrews 12, uh, 5 through 11. God's a father who loves you. And a loving father disciplines his kids. Because he, he doesn't want you to be experiencing the consequence, earning for yourself a bad reputation earning for yourself bad consequences in your life. And so he brings discipline. And so you don't want your heart to stray. You want just to receive that blessing and not discipline. And then C, be aware that the human heart and your heart, not just everybody else's, but your heart sinfully takes blessing without being grateful. That's the human heart. That's the sinful heart in us. That's the flesh in us. Our human hearts, our hearts sinfully take blessing without being grateful. Be grateful, people. That's the that's a scriptural through and through. And the, the more menial service somebody does for you, the more thankful you should be. Don't say, oh boy, that's menial service, and not say anything to that person. If someone does something for you, say thank you. And tell them why you appreciate they're doing that for you. Be grateful, and be grateful to God. And that should be a trigger, and that's, a, that's a, a rewiring of our sinful hearts. Our sinful hearts say, when blessing happens, it's because of me. Nebuchadnezzar chapter 4, right? The reason I rule over everything as far as I can see is because of my greatness, Nebuchadnezzar says. And God says, no it isn't, and I'll show you. And he takes away Nebuchadnezzar's sanity. And so we always want this truth. When, God, when things are good are happening to me, be grateful. Say, thank you, God, for this. I don't deserve it. You didn't owe this to me. You're just being nice. Like David says, God does not treat to Psalm 103. God does not treat us as our sins deserve. Or Psalm 100, one of those two. Our God does not treat us as our sins deserve. And so when good things happen to you, remember, be grateful. Deuteronomy 5, 6. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. This comes before he gives the Ten Commandments. He wants his people to realize the reason you're not in the reason we're not in slavery to sin anymore is because he rescued us from it. Um, then God tells them in the promised land, um, be grateful. In the midst of the promised land, be grateful. Um, it's a repeated exhortation in Scripture. So, here's the, here's the formula. Here's the real takeaway and the bang from this sermon. If you've been asleep, none of you have been. If you've been asleep until now, here's now tune in and focus in. This is life principle. I remember hearing this sitting in a seminary class, and it just struck me. Uh, it, it's a, the word from the prophets over and over. It's the word from Moses. It's the word from Jesus. It's the word from Paul. So, listen in. It's D. It's D. When God blesses you, instead, when God blesses you, so that's your blank, blesses. Instead, when God blesses you as your heart has gone after him, 
when you walked with the Lord, when you've been seeking Him, and He blesses you, instead of not being grateful, instead of trying to explain that by, well, I first did this, and I studied real hard, and I did ball handling drills in my basement every, you know, for a half an hour or every night each summer, which I did. Instead of crediting yourself for that, take note. Take note of the blessing. That's number one. Take note. Take note of the blessing. Okay, when something nice happens to you, God's sovereign, take note of this blessing. Say, this has happened to me and it's a nice thing. So take note. Number two, recognize that this nice thing that's happened to you is from God. Recognize that this blessing is from God. It's not because of you. Solomon also says right near that, that verse in, in Ecclesiastes 8, or at, toward the end of chapter 8, or maybe it's in the beginning of chapter 9, the race is not always to the swift. And he's not, Solomon does not mean, hey, have hope if you're really slow, you can win the gold medal in the Olympics. He's not saying that. He's saying life is unfair. You can be the fastest person in that race and not win. Right? That's, that's all the Olympics there. It's, it's, they're surprise winners. Somebody from, where's that? Oh, uh, if someone from Italy can win the 100 meters. They did. An Italian won the 100 meters this year. And, they, and he wasn't the fastest. He didn't have the fastest time in the world. But on that night, he felt juice in his legs. He felt energy. He had power coming out of those legs. And the other guys were running as fast as they could, and they couldn't keep up. Or our 200-meter champion, Noah Lyles, with the, the fastest time in the world, the undisputed fastest guy in the 200 meters, comes in, what was it, third or fourth? Third. Third uh, there. And, and the race is not always to the swift. God is sovereign. If you win the gold medal, if you get a blessing, regardless of your skill or lack thereof, it's because God made that happen. And so take note of that. Recognize the blessing is from God, no matter how hard you worked from it, for it, or if you just showed up and it popped in front of your face. Recognize the blessings from God. Number three, mark that God has been free to bless you and not discipline you because your heart has been seeking Him. If you've been seeking the Lord, if you've been putting your spiritual life first, if you've been putting worship first, and God is causing nice things to happen to you, say, this is me living in the promised land, walking in God's ways, and God's giving me abundant crops, and He's causing my enemies to flee in seven directions. Take note of this. Say, this is, this is God. He's free to bless me. The reason He's giving me all these nice things is He's not having to discipline me because I'm walking away from Him, because my heart is strained. Note that when God blesses you, that you've enabled that blessing. Because God's a good Father. He doesn't give you a car when you get all F's. Okay? He might give you a car by surprise if he's able to, or some nice gift. My dad never gave me a, a new car. I got a 76 Chevy Love that he had driven, that my brother had driven, and, and I drove in 1983, um, which was nice. But realize this. You know what? One of the reasons I'm being blessed here is because God's not having to put His energy toward my discipline. When we're walking with the Lord, He's, He's free just to do what He wants to do, which is bless us. And so we enable that. We may be walking with Him, and it may be time for us to be sharpened through hardship. But when that blessing comes, just know, I guess God's not having to discipline me here. Okay, and then... Um, number four, and this is real, this is why you got the asterisk here. Okay? Uh, uh, when God blesses you, when, God, when, when you're walking with Him and He blesses you, put your foot to the floor in pursuing Him and all the more. This is what happens in Scripture that God tells us to. When I bless you, remember me and I'll bless you more. When you're walking with me and I bless you, you think that's good? Just wait to what I want to give you. Just keep walking with me. When things are going well for you, make the connection. They're going well for me because I'm walking with the Lord. I love Him. And so I need to do that even more. 
This is what we don't see with Solomon. Solomon doesn't turn at the end of his, you know, toward the, toward the latter part of his life and say, look at all God's blessed me with. How could I walk away from him? How could I not heed the, the words of my father David who said, don't marry foreign wives, or they'll turn your heart away from me. How could I establish idolatrous worship in the land? Solomon doesn't, he doesn't see the blessing at the end of his life and put the, his foot to the floor, that's a racing, that's a, a you know, car thing. You know, if, if things are going well, just be all the more faithful. Receive all the more blessing. This is not prosperity gospel. This is your soul will be blessed all the more. When God blesses you, have that be a reminder, not that you've done a great thing. Have that be a reminder that God is the blesser, that he is sovereign. And when he blesses you, have that be a red flag that says, ooh, I need to obey even more. If I obeyed in this little way, and God blessed me like this, then what if I obey in this other thing that I've been hedging on? God will bless me there too. He's training us. So, um, you know, if, when you're in school or if you're in school, you know when you studied longer. You spend an hour studying instead of watching America's Got Talent the night before a test. And, and, you get a 90, and you get a 95 on the test instead of a 79. You know, that, that should say, you shouldn't walk away from that and say, oh, it doesn't matter how long I study. No, take note of that. And so the blessing of this 95 is because I spent this extra half hour studying. And, and in a similar way, as we walk with the Lord, not that we have perfect lives, as we prioritize our spiritual lives, as we prioritize our worship of Him, we, we know, hey, this, this winds up in good things in my soul. Good things in my soul as I walk with Him. So A, go. Go for receiving what God wants to give to you. That is more blessing mostly to your soul. So go for that. As you see God blessing you, go for more. And the way you go for more is seeing God's the giver of blessings. And he delights to bless me as I prioritize worship and walking with him. And B, put it a different way, get addicted to keeping, get addicted to keeping your heart thankful to God and to pursuing him as you see and note in your life the great results of your doing so. So Solomon should have looked at this palace as it was completed at the end of those 13 years and said, wow, God has been great to me. I'm so thankful. I'm the eighth kid of David. How did he even find me to choose me to be the one that took over for David and was king over all things? And then all this splendor he's given to me. And he's enabled me to build a, a temple for him. Boy, I'm grateful. And we want to be we want to be like that. So our summary, our summary. God delights to bless you. God delights to bless you. That's his demeanor. That's his, his, uh, what he wants to do. He delights to bless you and he continues blessing to you as your heart continues to seek him. And when God blesses you in life, when you have some kind of palace complex, Verses 1 through 12 here, whatever that would be in your life. Here should, you, here should be your response. You should press on to seek him more. Press on to seek him more. You say, hey, this is working. <laughs> Faithfulness is working. My soul feels good. I don't feel so guilty anymore. Someone can ask me, hey, have you done, did you do this? And you say, I did. Because you did. It's a great blessing to walk in God's ways. And God delights to bless you and say, yeah, that's, that's it. Do that all the more. Let's pray.